Progress. Good morning, everybody. This is a work session of the Portland City Council. Today's topic is our spring bump budget. It is April 5th, 2022. Before I turn this over to Director Kennard, I'd like to make some introductory remarks. Colleagues, in the spring of last year, Council came Glitch. Colleagues, in the spring of last year, Council came together to unify our priorities to best affect positive change in our community. We agreed that we would focus on the top priorities of homelessness, community safety, and economic recovery. These priorities have served as the framework 
in every spending package that we passed in 2021 and will continue to be the top priorities within my proposed budgets throughout 2022. We're beginning to see the impacts of these past investments as our rates of COVID continue to drop. Businesses are reopening and new restaurants and shops are emerging in Portland and our workforce is beginning to return to their places of employment. We recently released $600,000 to five community-based organizations working to reduce gun violence all across our city. Over the last 60 days, I've issued three emergency declarations, banning camping on high crash corridors, expediting the permitting and construction of safe rest villages, and forming the Street Services Coordination Center to begin connecting local agencies and service providers so that more homeless Portlanders are compassionately placed into safe shelter. Community events and gatherings are coming back to Portland. It was exciting to see the Shamrock Run, the Winter Light Festival, as well as the opening of the Saturday market, bringing thousands upon thousands of people into Portland. We're also preparing to release $500,000 in grants for additional events throughout the city this summer. As we celebrate this progress, we must continue to make investments that address homelessness, improve community safety, and support economic development. We need to fund a package that anticipates challenges we will experience in the coming months, a need to transport and shelter our most vulnerable Portlanders from severe weather, addressing ongoing gun violence across the city with prevention and intervention tools, and supporting the small businesses and community events that bring us together. Today, we're going to hear an overview of the spring budget monitoring process known best as the spring bump, which is one of three major budgeting processes the city undergoes each year. The spring bump is historically comprised of true ups using small amounts of funds that remain within the current fiscal year budget. This process happens simultaneously to the work we're doing on our full year budget, which council will vote on in several weeks. As such, the funding available for the spring bump is reserved for relatively small programmatic changes and must be committed by the end of the fiscal year. After the overview, we'll go line by line to learn about the spring bump packages put forward by each of our bureaus. Then we'll discuss my proposed spring bump funding package, which council will vote on next Wednesday, April 13th. My proposal reflects the significant potential personnel costs needed in the current year to account for recent bargained labor agreements, as well as overtime costs. In my spring bump guidance to bureaus, I directed that bump requests be limited to requests for compensation set aside and contingency for current year personnel costs, including additional expenses related to approved labor bargained agreements. Requests for carryover for one-time only funded projects approved in fiscal year 21-22 budget or that help to fund a program request for the fiscal year 2022-23 budget and requests that based on projections will allow for bureaus to end the current fiscal year within budget. Bureaus ended up requesting less than what was originally anticipated from personal con personnel contingency resources that we set aside. As such, my proposed bump package includes a handful of new appropriations that meet urgent recovery needs with focus on the upcoming summer months. For reference colleagues, these are the items that we reviewed in our brief meetings yesterday. Those appropriations include two years of funding for the Street Services Coordination Center to provide transportation to unsheltered homeless individuals who want to move to an open shelter space or available housing. One time federal funding for Bybee Lakes Hope Center to support both their existing programs and the expansion of their facility by nearly 200 beds. Additional investments in community-based safety programs to expand ceasefire efforts during the upcoming summer months, 
More details on this will be forthcoming. Economic recovery efforts for small businesses and food carts that are predominantly run by Black, Indigenous, people of color, and the LGBTQ plus business owners citywide. And funding to put on signature Portland summer events like the Rose Festival, Petal Palooza, the Blues Festival, Juneteenth, and many more. Before I turn this over to Director Kennard, I wanna thank all of my fellow commissioners for sharing their thoughts on the best, how to best allocate these limited funds. I wanna thank Commissioner Ryan for your hard work on the Fairfield Retail Revitalization Project to help create intergenerational wealth for BIPOC businesses. I wanna thank Commissioners Rubio and Commissioner Hardesty for your leadership around gun violence, particularly with the Mount Scott pilot, which we're looking to expand to other parts of the city. And thank you to Commissioner Maps for your partnership in supporting summer events so that we can better promote treasured community gatherings while supporting the economic recovery of our city. I'd like to welcome Director Kennard, the Director of our City Budget Office, to provide an overview of the spring bump and walk us through the details of my proposed package. Welcome, Director Kennard. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Mayor, for that introduction, and good morning, members of the Council. Um, Robert, actually, if you could, could take that down for a second. I'm going to uh, uh, beg everybody's pardon. We have one other item today that I would like to get to, which is um, a holdover from last Thursday's work session. Um, we had folks from the Bureau of Environmental Services that were ready to present on a couple of small, relatively small requests for ARPA resources last Thursday, and we ran out of time. And so I didn't want to run out of time again today. So I, I hope that we can quickly have um, the BES team give their presentation that they had uh, intended for last Thursday on their ARPA request. Um, it will only be you know, 20 minutes or less, and then we will proceed with our regularly scheduled bump work session. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn this the floor over to Alice Brawley Chesworth from the Bureau of Environmental Services to quickly walk through our uh, their request for American Rescue Plan Act resources in next year's budget. Thank you. Excuse me, Director Kennard. Uh, were you going to have the Office of Equity and Human Rights give us some kind of grounding before we jumped in? Um, so, uh, so uh, Interim Director Selby was not able to join us today. Um, we do have uh, Asena John Bats Boren standing in his stead. Um, who wrote in our, our chat that they were not going to have formal remarks, but I will just serve to remind everybody that um, to please, uh, it, when you uh, introduce yourself, if you feel comfortable, please state your preferred pronouns. Um, it creates a more inclusive environment. Um, please, uh, if you have a presentation, please describe any visual uh, or pictures in, in that presentation, which makes the presentation material more accessible for those who have low vision or um, are not able to view the presentation. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, for that reminder. I will turn it over to Bureau of Environmental Services. All right, thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, community members, and colleagues. My name is Alice Brawley Chestworth, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. I'm a policy analyst at the Bureau of Environmental Services, and I'm presenting today on behalf of Angela Henderson, BES's Equity and Workforce Development Manager, who had an unavoidable conflict this morning. I'll go through the first of BES's three ARPA requests and then hand over to my colleagues for the other two. Um, we hopefully will take questions after the three short presentations, if that's okay with you. So today I'm introducing an ARPA funding proposal to fund several workforce, green workforce opportunity program positions at the Bureau of Environmental Services as part of a proposed workforce development strategy designed to eradicate imbalances in access, opportunity, and support by expanding career and economic opportunities for community members to enter the workforce, particularly members of our community who face historical and contemporary barriers like Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. The GROW program is a targeted workforce development strategy that supports the city's core values and commitments to architecting new systems that dismantle inequitable workforce systems and structures by positioning equity at the core of its workforce development strategy. On the slide are a couple of um, uh, graphics that talk a little bit about the Green Workforce Collaborative and the Academy. 
approved, the GROW program proposal would establish a paid career opportunities program in partnership with the Green Workforce Collaborative, a community-focused collective comprised of the Blueprint Foundation, Self-Enhancement Inc., Wisdom of the Elders, the Native American Youth and Family Center, and Ecotrust. This slide and the next help illustrate the need for a program like GROW. This, a graph that is on the slide right now, shows racial gaps, disproportionality, and the outcomes of income inequality in our city. Depicted in the graph, although Black and Indigenous people make up about 6% and 1% of the population of Portland, respectively, an overwhelming percentage of Black and Indigenous Portlanders are living in poverty, with levels of 30% and 22%, respectively. And as the nation and our city become more diverse, the cost of inequity will grow without intervention. Through the GROW program, we can help to transform economic, economic opportunities and life outcomes for BIPOC community members. On this slide is the composition of BES's workforce as recently as May 29, 2022. Of the total 606 employees at BES, 23 or 4% identify as Black and 5 or 1% identify as Indigenous. BES has a role to play in overcoming hiring differentials. However, BES is not unique nor alone in this responsibility. BES and Bureau Citywide can help to reduce these differentials by partnering with organizations like the Green Workforce Collaborative, whose mission, service, and racial equity goals and initiatives align with ours. The GROW program will establish a range of pipeline careers throughout the city and leverage an apprentice model with multiple positions across many disciplines. For example, at Environmental Services, BIPOC workers are underrepresented in public health, water quality, and environmental jobs. The GROW program would establish a paid, focused career opportunity providing entry-level jobs and skills building across city bureaus, with wages dependent on the specific position and level of detail and responsibilities. A key feature of the program is that it will focus outreach to graduates of the Green Workforce Academy, a nationally accredited program that introduces BIPOC community members to green jobs. Recruitment selection for the positions would be via an open competitive process with preferred qualifications that inform interview and selection. The GROW program will be com complemented through ongoing mentorship, job readiness support, and coaching. And because racial socioeconomic gaps are wide and persistent for BIPOC communities, program participants may rely on other supports to bridge those gaps. As such, the GROW would be designed to allow for a flexible work schedule, ranging from 24 to 40 hours per week, as established and determined with their respective supervisors. And after a year of training, mentoring, job coaching, and achieving the objectives of a customized training plan, incumbents would advance into entry-level positions via a simple personnel action, thereby creating both a sustained career pathway in the city and an on-ramp to, on to our organization. The GROW is emerging as a scalable, employment-focused approach to improving the economic opportunities and outcomes for communities that have been historically excluded and disenfranchised. It will allow for more diversity within and across our organization, expand social interaction, and enhance bureau and city, and lead to improved policies, strategies, and systems that better position the city in our work to become an anti-racist organization. In closing, the GROW is a prospective program model that can be expanded to reach a critical mass of BIPOC adults with sufficient scale and support. And the opportunities and benefits of such an intentional career opportunity program are mutually beneficial and far-reaching. Thank you. And now my colleague, Jen Bildersey, will share information about our next ARPA funding request related to Portland's Brownfields program. Thanks, Alice. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your time this morning. My name is Jen Bildersey. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and I coordinate the Brownfield program at BES. The Brownfield program provides technical and financial assistance to address contamination on public and private properties all around the city. On this slide is a map of the more than 70 sites where we have worked. And when you think contaminated site, you maybe picture a very large industrial property, but most of the places we work are smaller sites on Portland's commercial corridors, places that were gas stations, dry cleaners, other uses that left behind soil contamination, usually in the mid 1900s. Uh, cleaning up contaminated sites protects watershed health, that's why we live at BES, but it also addresses environmental disparities, helps reach our land use goals, improves livability, and contributes to our tax base, and it supports public health. Uh, Portland's program was launched because of an environmental justice initiative at EPA in the late 90s, and EJ continues to guide the way that we do our work now. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Alice? So the graphic on this slide shows that the properties where we have worked have gone on to become 18 parks, 
12 community gardens, 28 nonprofits, 31 small businesses, and most relevant for today's discussion, 780 units of affordable housing. When you think about siting housing that is going to be either close in or well connected to transit, many of those properties have a long and sometimes complicated history of past use. And especially if they are available today in 2022, they might be available specifically because they have some environmental barrier. Um, but that is not bad news in this case. It's what makes them an opportunity right now for affordable housing. And it's very possible to clean up most commercial contaminated sites so that they are safe to live on. It takes time and it takes technical knowledge and it takes money. And we have supported many community partners uh, to do just that. And some of them are listed here, Hacienda, Habitat for Humanity, PCRI, Sabin, Reach, Bridge Housing, Proud Ground, Innovative Housing, Council on Aging, Catholic Charities, Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a few examples of places like this on the next slide. So this slide shows three sites that had environmental barriers to reuse. On the top are the before pictures. So they were a lumber yard, a chemical storage site, and a battery recycling facility. We worked with community partners um, to work through the additional steps that are needed on a property like this to make sure that the property is completely clean and safe and could then be developed as affordable housing, which is pictured in the bottom photos. So Renaissance Commons, the Beatrice Morrow Apartments, and the Songbird. These three buildings all employ the North Northeast Housing Preference Policy, and they are three of the 14 sites where the Brownfield Program has provided assistance uh, that have become affordable housing. Last slide, please, Alice. So the request here today is for funding to make sure that more properties are safe and clean for reuse that addresses Portland's housing crisis. As pictured on this slide, that could be affordable housing, um, like shown previously, but it could also include other uses that support the shelter to housing continuum, like safe rest villages. So that's our very short version, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. For right now, I will hand things off to Svetlana. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Svetlana Hedin. My pronouns are she, hers. I'm with Bureau of Environmental Services Community Partnerships team. This slide shows the map of um, east end of Morrison Bridge, uh, where we did our project uh, that I will be talking about. So this project brings together partners in collaboration at the east end of Morrison Bridge to plant trees, restore and maintain stormwater sites that were impacted by camping and engaging the houseless community through education and paid stewardship projects. Environmental services protect public health, water quality, and the environment. Uh, we began planting trees in 1996 as a key tool to stormwater management. Trees are also great for human health, air quality, cooling benefits to counter the urban heat island effect and climate change. Our Green Street Steward Program is a decade old, engaging the community to adapt and care for green streets. Our green stormwater infrastructure operation and maintenance team takes care of thousands of green streets and water quality facilities throughout Portland. All of our work includes outreach, education, and community capacity building. The Central East Side Industrial Council, the local business district, wanted to adapt and clean up these spaces. They approached Green Street Steward Program about taking these sites on. Together with Ground Score Association, which is a peer-led participatory program of Trash for Peace, a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2019, Ground Score Association facilitates low barrier jobs opportunities for environmental workers who collect and sell discarded materials and prioritize opportunities for those who, have, who, who face housing and job insecurity. Ground Score Association coordinators are paid $25 an hour and workers are paid $20 an hour. The Bioswell program is an educational stewardship model that pays workers that live in the bioswells to care for the plants and trees. Currently, this program has been active since November of 2020 and phase one concentrated on building relationships with the communities living in the bioswell 
general cleaning of debris and planting shrubs and trees. Multnomah County is a partner, is a property owner and partner, and the Friends of Trees is a longtime tree steward partner. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows um, actual event happening, and we have lots of people planting trees. So that's the pictures on this slide. Stewards are provided paid internship to learn, plant, mulch, and water trees and maintain the bioswales. Campers become more conscientious about their personal footprint in these delicate spaces. Commissioner Maps and local news media joined in on our planting day. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, close up of Commissioner Maps and other stewards during the planting event. Um, this is my favorite quote um, from Commissioner Maps. Uh, Together, government, business, and people who are unhoused are repairing our infrastructure and repairing our community ties. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, the gathering of people during one of the steward activities and introduction and uh, another picture of a person sitting and watching um, demonstration of how to plant a tree. This is another quote from Steve S. He's a ground score worker. And he says, this project shows that the homeless care about the environment and want to contribute to the beautification of community around them. ARPA funds will be used to continue this project in the coming year. Next slide, please. That's it. Thank you. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. And, and so our panelists know, our, our work session participants know, I planned on 90 minutes for our bump session conversation. So I think we could spend about seven minutes on discussion if you'd like, if there are any questions. Yes, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you both for those very um, informative presentation. My first question really has to do with brownfields. We've been talking about brownfields since I showed up in 1990. How many brownfields do we still have in the city of Portland? And are we, I mean, are, are we done? <laughs> well, how many do we have left? Commissioner Hardesty, I wish that we were done, but unfortunately, um... It's a very large problem. Our latest study out of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability found that there were over 900 acres of brownfields still remaining around the city. Um, and on, as you can expect, we've we've really tackled most of the low hanging fruit. So we have what's left are some very complicated sites. And then we also have some sites that aren't that complicated, but are just small and scattered all around the city, which are mostly the, you know, the commercial sites like, um, like those on the map that I showed in my slides that just need to be addressed one by one. Some of them are quite easy to address, but they do take extra, extra technical steps and extra funding to get through. And are we prioritizing brownfields that the city owns? Or are we prioritizing somebody else's vision of development of these brownfields? Most of the brownfields that are out there are in private ownership, um, multiple owners. Uh, yeah. So the city is addressing city owned brownfields and then um, we are working with private property owners to try and address privately owned brownfields individually. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that feedback. I'd love to have a deeper conversation because, again, if we own brownfields, wouldn't we prioritize cleaning up our own brownfields so we could actually spend money on developing housing people could afford to live in or businesses people could afford to lease and that kind of stuff. So love we to have can, a longer conversation about that. We will connect with your office to do that. Thanks very much. Thank you. And then I did have a question about this employment program. Has BES done anything like this before? Hi, Commissioner Hardesty. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I am unaware of anything in specifically like this, but we certainly did take uh, lessons from other um, internship programs and some of our um, 
uh, I, I can't think of the word off the top of my head, but uh, apprenticeship programs um, that we've had. And so we've taken those lessons learned to figure out how to do this um, in the best way. And that's why we've added things like mentoring and career pathways um, into this program to make it um, uh, more effective um, based on lessons learned and also why we're partnering um, with some of the ones who, who add additional training because we found out if we just open up some jobs, um, a lot of times we don't get a lot of uh, BIPOC applicants because they haven't, they don't yet have sort of those skills that we specifically look for. And so by partnering with um, an organization that really teaches some of those skills, we're hoping that when we advertise to that group of people who have graduated, we'll have a lot more of the qualified applicants to be able to bring in. And my big concern is, so this is a pilot program, you do it once, there's no additional money, then what happens? Yes, um, that is a concern for us also, but um, we're really feeling like if we get the pilot program going and get those lessons learned and show how effective it can be, that we will then put it into our subsequent budgets um, over the years. So just, I guess, for the body, uh, we don't do a good job of hiring BIPOC folks, and we don't do a good job of retaining them once we actually get them on board. But I am concerned about these one-off programs. Um, I'm working now with uh, uh, the first responder bureaus to do a summer works employment program. I'm curious as to why we're not using summer works rather than creating an individual bureau-specific program. Um, Again, we, you know, we have great ideas, but if we only have funding for one time, I get very concerned that we continue to start and stop things with no, with no systemic concern about what the impact will be. Um, again, great ideas, uh, nothing against the idea, but as a city, we're not really good at figuring out what's in the benefit of the city as compared to individual bureaus. So thank you so much. Appreciate the questions, the answers. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate those comments. And I will take them to Angela, who has put this program together and um, see if uh, she has any follow up. Are there any other questions for our environmental services team? All right. Thank you so much, um, Alice and Jen and Spitlana for being here again today. Um, and thank you to the council for um, hearing that presentation uh, and, and switching gears quickly. Um, we are now going to switch back to talking about the spring supplemental budget. And um, so uh, Robert, if you could please pull up uh, the presentation for our regular business for today. All right, um, so again, for the record, my name is Jessica Kennard. I am the city's budget director. I use she, her pronouns. I am joined today with, by Robert Cheney uh, and Jane Marie Ford in the budget office, who are our analysts that lead our supplemental budget process. Uh, please go to the next slide. So the agenda for today uh, is for uh, us to first, uh, for me to first provide a high level summary of the supplemental budget process and the changes. Um, we'll then review general fund requests, followed by non-general fund notable changes. I'll highlight changes in position authority briefly, there's just one. And then I'll close by reviewing the general fund contingency and where it stands based upon the mayor's proposed supplemental budget. As with other work sessions, this is intended to be a conversation and we can pause for discussion or questions at any time. Uh, we'll also have time for more robust discussion at the end after I review this information. Uh, my office will help facilitate any follow-up and question and answer that's needed so that the council has all the information that you need in order to make decisions next week. And then a note on timing, uh, the spring bump takes place simultaneously with discussions around subsequent year's budget. Uh, what we're discussing today affects the current year budget. We're not specifically discussing changes to next year's budget. The way that these two processes intersect is primarily through the carryover of resources from one year to the next via program carryovers in the bump, which we'll discuss. Um, there's also an opportunity for council to preserve available one-time resources to fund priority packages in next year's budget. Um, so this slide shows the different uh, processes that are typically included in the spring bump, many of which we will talk about today. Um, as the mayor mentioned, the spring bump is the second of three budget monitoring processes that we undertake each year. And the spring bump is primarily meant to provide year-end financial projections. We look towards the end of the year, we make current year budget adjustments, and we true up costs between fiscal years, 
primarily with an eye towards ensuring that we don't overextend our budget. Uh, so as part of this, we also uh, have this process, we also have program carriers, which I just mentioned. Um, we uh, do interagency adjustments. Uh, we have the option to allocate contingency resources, and we also can make other technical changes. Uh, so in all funds, I will say at a high level, the mayor's proposed supplement, uh, supp supplemental budget results in a net increase of citywide appropriations totaling over almost 183 million, but the majority of this net increase again relates to some of these technical changes, truing up of beginning fund balances and um, uh, recognizing resources in funds that are managed by non-general fund bureaus. Next slide, please. So the mayor released guidance for bureaus drafting their requested spring bump submissions, which outlined the types of requests that he was looking for. The guidance allowed for requests for compensation set aside for other current year personnel costs, including general fund backed labor costs resulting from recently approved labor bargaining agreements. The guidance also specified that bureaus could request one time carryover of general fund resources to either continue work that was funded in the current fiscal year, but which the bureau anticipates completing in the next fiscal year, um, but also could identify and request carryover of projected underspending in order to fund one time requests made as part of the next year's requested budget. Uh, requests for new general fund for the guidance were limited to those that prevent overexpenditure in the current year. Next slide, please. So the spring bump timeline is extremely condensed. Bureaus submitted their requested changes on March 17th. The budget office had roughly two weeks to perform technical checks and analysis. While we briefed execs on the requests and CBO recommendations last week, we just released our written reviews yesterday. And in order to meet our required timeline, the mayor needed to file his proposed supplemental budget today. And so today we are going to talk about what is in the proposed supplemental budget. And the mayor mentioned a number of um, initiatives that he has included, which we will walk through. Um, but we also uh, are talking about this today with the understanding that next, in the next week, uh, we will have further conversations with the council and with the mayor, and that this next week will prove an especially important time to work with the council on any questions and potential amendments that you would like to see uh, to what has been filed. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, the, the list of contingency balances that we are starting with, that we started with during the spring bump, um, which are the balances that we were left with following the fiscal year 21-22 fall bump, which council passed just four months ago. This year's budget included $5.2 million in compensation set aside. This was supplemented this year by over $12 million in additional set aside funds that were anticipated to be needed for current year employee costs, including retroactive COLA step and merit costs for our DCTU, PPA, and non-represented employees. It also included funding for general fund-backed bargain labor costs for DCTU and PPA members. Additionally, we retained our standard $3 million in unrestricted contingency for urgent and unforeseen needs. And finally, we started the spring bump this year with $12.4 million in policy set aside which are funds that have been earmarked for specific purposes. Next slide, please. So that concludes the high level overview. I'm gonna now turn to the requested decisions and what has been included in the mayor's proposed supplemental budget. And again, um, for this portion, um, folks can interject, raise your hand if you have questions about any of these line items. Um, as we walk through them, I will give a brief overview of each of the items and then um, pause to see if there are questions. Uh, next well, slide. I love the uh, the overview slide. I think that's very, very, very creative. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Okay, so we're going to start with the new general fund requests. These are requests for uh, general fund contingency resources. Um, and so I will just orient you a little bit to the slide. We have the bureau name on the left that's requesting the change. Um, we have the name of the package in the middle. We have the amount that the Bureau requested in um, the second to right column. And then the final right column is the amount that has been included in the mayor's proposed budget as filed. Now, when you see a zero in the first, um, in, in the spring requested total and a number in the second column, that indicates that this was a package that was added by the mayor in his filing. Um, so the first one falls into that category. Um, this is additional street services uh, funding for additional street services coordination center, which the mayor referenced in his opening talking points. Um, so as a reminder in the fall bump, 
Council allocated $175,000 for the Street Services Coordination Center. That funding was originally budgeted in the Portland Housing Bureau, and it is in, in the filing being transferred to the Community Safety Division for the work. And the request here is for an additional $50,000 uh, to uh, uh, provide funding to ensure uh, uh, there's funding for an incident commander, communications position, administrative support, and two fire inspectors and investigators. So this supplements $175,000 that was provided in the bump and ensures that the, the SSCC has what it needs to get started um, over the next few months. Uh, the next item is uh, 700 and it's just shy of $750,000. Um, it's uh, a request that came from the Spectator Venues Program in the Office of Management and Finance. It's for one-time general fund resources to address groundwater intrusion issues at the city-owned Providence Park Stadium, which began in August of 2020. So it's difficult to definitively prove the cause of the increase in groundwater, but research conducted over the past 12 months suggests that the most likely factors that have led to the dramatic changes in groundwater flows are the combined efforts of um, Bureau of Environmental Services um, from the adjacent uh, sewer relining project and the Bureau of Development Services permitted public and private development projects that changed existing groundwater flows. Um, so uh, what's in here is, uh, is, is not, what, why there's a zero here is because the mayor's proposed filing does not include general fund to support this, but what is assumed is in line with the CBO recommendation, which is for uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services and the Bureau of Development Services to split the cost of this, um, of, of, of this uh, required um, uh, project. Um, and that is something that I will share that I am in conversation with the attorney's office on, and I know that there's additional conversation that needs to happen with um, both of the commissioners in charge of those two bureaus. But for right now, it is assumed that those two bureaus will cover the costs of this project. Uh, the next item is um, also related to uh, the Street Services Coordination Center. This is $500,000 to provide transportation services for those experiencing unsh unsheltered houselessness in order to move themselves and their belongings from an outdoor camp posted for removal into a shelter, temporary housing, or permanent housing space. The next item is $1.4 million to fund additional community safety investments to mitigate gun violence for the upcoming summer. This program includes geographic and neighborhood-focused project areas, and proposal details will be finalized after engaging with community stakeholders, as the mayor referred to in his opening remarks. The next item uh, is $23,316 to fund street design improvements at the intersection of 72nd and Woodstock to address community concerns. The improvements will seek to affect livability, business needs, safety, and include making improvements to signs, street siping, and add concrete planters. The next item uh, is $35,495 to cover the costs associated with street closures, permitting work over 26 weekends in the entertainment district in Old Town Chinatown between February through July of 2022. So council previously allocated general fund resources in the fall bump to support permitting between August through November of last summer. And this request would cover the remaining costs of the program through July of this year. The next item is uh, $1.7 million that is being requested by the Fire Bureau um, to cover overtime costs. Due to additional awarded leave, Portland Fire and Rescue is projecting to overspend their current year budget by $5.7 million. Any additional leave taken drives mandatory overtime costs in the Bureau as there's no option for fire to scale down their services and their station model. So the Bureau is working to manage the total budget deficit by appropriating new resources, reducing materials and services and capital spending and drawing from compensation set aside. And this 1.7 is to fund the remaining final gap. The next item is $110,000, um, which represents the estimated overtime costs associated with having Portland Fire and Rescue employees report to Street Services Coordination Center through the end of June. So there are three items related to getting the Street Service Coordination Center up and running, and all three are included in the mayor's uh, supplemental budget as proposed. This next item is a negative number, and that's because it's a return to the general fund. This is money coming back to the general fund. It returns $2.6 million in one-time general fund discretionary resources that were appropriated to the police bureau to accelerate the hiring of 30 police officers in the current year. 
You'll recall that last year in the adopted budget, actually, Council approved $5.3 million in total one-time resources to allow for accelerated hiring over a two-year period. This represents the, the first half. And so it was allocated to the Police Bureau, um, and, and they have not reached a level of hiring where one, the one-time funds were needed, as a significant number of sworn officer vacancies were funded with ongoing, um, uh, that have been, uh, sorry, uh, sworn officer vacancies funded with ongoing resources remain unfilled. So the Bureau, since they did not use this resource as they had been directed, um, are returning these resources back to the general fund. Yes, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, thank you, Director Kennard. Uh, so 2.6 million is being returned from the police bureau for, high, for the expedited hire. If I recall, didn't we also put 30 FTE into a lockbox also for positions within Portland Police Bureau during the last budget process? Um, so, so this funding was for was for accelerated hiring of 30 FTE. Essentially, that is that is somewhat what you did with the money. There were no new positions. This is this money would have gone to sort of double filling or overfilling positions to allow um, folks once they come off of uh, probation and get out of training, they would drop into positions that would become that were anticipated to become vacant due to retires re retirements in the future. So there were no um, set positions associated with this funding, but it was what it was connected to the filling over essentially over hiring of 30 positions. And by by sort of putting this funding, um, saying that this funding had to be dedicated for this purpose, you essentially did lock it up for this purpose and they did since they didn't use it, they're returning it back to the general fund. Thank you. That helps. All right, so the next item um, is $500,000 for uh, promoting economic recovery for BIPOC small businesses and food carts. This program will be used by the city and other employers to encourage office workers to reconnect with local small businesses and food carts. Next item is $500,000 uh, in one-time general fund resources as all of these are to double the amount of funding for grants to support businesses with immediate physical repair needs and provide an urgent intervention to the city's neighborhoods and commercial corridors. Based on overwhelming need from businesses, Prosper believes that the agency would be able to spend down the entire $500,000 before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, the next item is $100,000 to go towards business operations and support of the East Portland Com Chamber of Commerce. The next item is $200,000 to support next steps for critical life and safety upgrades needed at the Keller Auditorium. Um, the next item is also a return to the general fund. That's why it shows up as a negative number. It's a technical true up of the current appropriation level uh, target uh, that was housed in special appropriations. Um, and then the final item on the list is $435,000 to allocate funding for sponsorships for upcoming summer events. This includes the Blues Festival, Rose Festival, Juneteenth, Oregon Brewers Festival, Pride, and Petalpalooza, which was also mentioned in the mayor's opening remarks. Any questions on any of these? Okay, so you'll see, oh yes, uh, Commissioner, hard to see. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm just curious if all the summer signature event dollars have all been allocated to events already. Is there no flexibility for other community events and other parts of the city that are that people may want to do? Um, I see we have Sam Adams uh, on the line, and actually, well, Mayor, I'm not sure if you would like to respond or if. Or yeah, if let, let me go ahead and jump in. Then maybe Sam has something to offer. Uh, absolutely, the intention here is to reflect community events throughout the city, and so we we have not made final decisions about which events. Uh, but the intention here is to not only support some of the bigger downtown events, similar to what we did uh, most recently, uh, but to also look at some of the neighborhood-based events. And how would community members find out that these funds are available, or are we going to give them an opportunity to apply, or are we just going to give it to folks that we... Sam, do you, do you have more information on that? Yes, Mayor. Thanks for the questions, Commissioner. Um, the uh, we granted in the last regular budget process uh, 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 resources for the uh, events and activation table, and that RFP actually I think goes out today. So we funded non-TAM TAM events in the last regular budget 
process, sort of less of the larger events, but more of the community-based events. And then uh, based on sort of your inquiry though, and Commissioner Rubio's, uh, we're gonna propose an amendment to this to add $200,000 for uh, other signature events around the city. So we've got an offering out there for the smaller events that the city council funded in the regular budget process. And then this is really focused on events between now and July 1st. Um, because they'll be coming, we'll be coming forward with another series of grants and event sponsorships for for the uh, the next fiscal process. But you're right, and Commissioner Rubio is right to sort of catch. We need to put some. Uh, we're, we're suggesting another two hundred thousand dollars for other major events like uh, Good in the Hood and and other events out there. Uh, thank you so much for that, Sam. Yeah, I am concerned that this process happens behind closed doors and community members don't get an opportunity to seek these resources. The last time I understood the money was spent before we knew that there was money available. So I would really hope for a more inclusive process because as you, as you uh, correctly stated, uh, there will be events happening all over the city and yet many parts of the city don't have access to city money. So thank you. You bet. And we'll get out to all the council offices, the request for proposals that's opening up this week. Any other questions on any of these new requests before we move to the next slide? I wanted to make sure that the entertainment district is merely for traffic calming devices and we're not actually committing PBOT to anything other than cones um, because we've had a lot of requests for us to do things much more significant than that. So I just wanna have it on the public record. That is what we're funding here, is that correct? Cones and staff time to put cones up in the entertainment district. Can someone respond to that? Sam has put his hand up. I don't know if they can hear that on the public record, Sam. <laughs> Uh, but Sam yes. Adams has put his thumb up to affirm that is accurate. Is that correct? Correct, uh, Commissioner. This provides uh, for the um, uh, for the permits and then also for some of the equipment. You're correct. Okay, just wanted to double check that. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So as part of budget development, the budget office budgets in a central account a portion of the current appropriation level associated with cost of living adjustments or COLAs, as well as health benefit increases for general fund bureaus. So we take money for, our, um, we, we set aside funding that is needed for, to fund general fund COLA in the central compensation set aside account. And then in the subsequent year's budget, these amounts all get rolled into the bureau's base budget on an ongoing basis. Um, so these funds are known as the compensation set aside. In most bureaus, these costs can be absorbed by, by vacancies experienced in the regular course of business. However, when bureaus are at or close to full staffing throughout most of the year, uh, they're, or they're otherwise expected to overspend their personnel budgets, they can request the necessary compensation set, set aside to cover personnel costs. Any remaining resources become available for the council to allocate for other current or future budget needs. In the current fiscal year, the city also set aside resources for potential costs related to labor bargaining costs, which I mentioned earlier, and that um, and these types of requests will be featured on the next slide. Um, due to significant vacancies citywide in the current year, bureaus have requested notably less than what was set aside for personal contingency costs, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what you see in front of you are the requests for, um, for compensation set aside and what has been included in the mayor's uh, proposed. So um, I'm just going to spend time um, walking through the ones that have not been included uh, in the mayor's uh, proposed budget as filed. And that includes the first item, um, which was the request from the Bureau of Emergency Communications. Um, the Bureau has significant personnel underspending, and so the request has not been included at this time. Um, the uh, next item is a request from the Bureau of Environmental Services. Um, and this request is actually tied to um, the impacts that the Bureau is experiencing as a result of uh, the agreed upon labor bargaining agreement with um, our DCTU um, employees. 
And, um, and so specifically for uh, a $3,000 per employee uh, bonus that, that was appro approved. Um, so typically labor costs are expected to be covered by the fund which supports the employee. And so um, we centrally set aside general fund resources for employees that are supported with general fund and would expect other funds to support the costs of those employees. Um, BS has requested and it is acceptable for bureaus to request uh, a, a general fund one-time subsidy. They have requested it, but in conversations with them, it sounded um, like they, they had indic BES had indicated an ability to absorb those costs without material service delivery or rate impacts. And so um, this has not been included in what the mayor has filed. Um, so the next item, um, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability is included. Um, Office of Government Relations, um, the, the Bureau initially requested resources to help cover um, personnel costs. Um, including costs for um, uh, uh, for um, a payout associated with a, a departing director. Um, however, the bureau and the budget office reviewed their projections, and we both agree that they actually do not need this um, resource to uh, stay in balance throughout the end of the year. So, um, so that funding is not uh, included. Um, the next item is um, within the office of management and finance, um, and that is included. Um, Office of City Attorney's request is included um, uh, be primarily because they have been at near full staffing um, in addition to having uh, two anticipated retirement leave payouts. Um, as we discussed before, Portland Fire and Rescue is drawing on compensation set aside to help a multi-pronged strategy as part of their multi-pronged strategy to deal with um, additional leave costs. Um, the Portland set it, uh, the Portland Parks and Recreation. So the Bureau, the, this is not included. The Bureau has sustained significant vacancy savings over the year, and it's not anticipated to require this resource to end the year on budget. But I will say that this assessment is, is very much complicated by the interaction between the parks operating levy resources and the general fund, as both resources um, are budgeted together in um, the general fund, uh, fund 100 account. So I want to acknowledge that, that the commissioner in charge has released a memo that requests that this resource be allocated in order to maximize support for the levy. And this is an important issue that does have larger policy implications and is a discussion, is, is, a, is a, um, a, an, an opportunity for, for the council to, to discuss and weigh in. Yes, Commissioner Rubio. Hi, I just wanted to make a quick point um, before we move on. Um, are you done with the slide or I can finish when you're done with the slide? This is a good time for you. I'm not done with the slide, but this okay. is a great time for you to. Okay. Um, so while I really appreciate CBO's perspective on this, um, this and this approach without council direction is a, more of a technical one, uh, but this is really a policy issue that I think we need to um, sort through as a council. Uh, and I'm talking about the levy in, in, in respect with, the, with parks. Um, current budget practices don't exactly fit well with this levy resource, which is new and incremental resource. And the parks levy was intended to be incremental funding for an incrementally expanding services that are above base level services funded by the general fund. So uh, I just want to be clear uh, with people so they understand that uh, parks is not asking for new resources. Uh, we're simply asking that to meet the intent of the voters that we should fully utilize the currently allocated general fund first for parks, including set aside, so that we're keeping the promises that council made to voters about not substituting general fund with levy. Um, and I, this is a memo that I sent to many of you um, a few weeks ago and our staffs have been communicated, com communicating about this. So I appreciate the engagement. Um, and just the last thing I'll say on it is that we're just now ramping up services with the levy um, and we're thankful uh, for the voter trust in us, um, but we believe this adaptation is necessary, the adaptation is necessary to retain that trust, but we can talk more offline about it. I just wanted to clear it for folks that are watching. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so the next item is a, um, a request from uh, the Portland Water Bureau, and this is similar to um, the request that came from the Bureau of Environmental Ser Services. They're requesting resources um, to cover the cost, help cover the cost of the recently agreed to uh, bargaining agreement with our uh, district council and trade, trade union employees, um, specifically the uh, funding to uh, cover the cost of the, the one-time bonuses that, that were approved. And, and so this is a notable cost. This is you know, $1.2 million. 
Um, again, typically uh, we rely on uh, individual funds to cover the costs of the of labor bargained agreements. Um, uh, the uh, Portland Water Bureau employees are supported by ratepayer resources. Um, the Bureau is, uh, we will note that the Bureau is projected to have lower than budgeted revenues this year. And so absorbing this cost could require the Bureau to make internal trade-offs or have a rate impact. So this is another area where this is uh, potentially a decision that that council will um, uh, look to have further conversations around um, regarding the, the decision to whether or not um, council wants to, to put $1.2 million of general fund towards this issue or would like the Bureau to um, uh, make internal trade-offs. Okay, uh, any other questions on any of these items? Okay, we will go to the next slide. All right, so this uh, slide is showing a combination of requests to draw on policy set aside, um, uh, uh, accounts that were set aside for specific purposes, um, as well as uh, requests to draw uh, funding for the um, both um, non-represented um, uh, merit costs, as well as labor bargained agreements. Um, so you see a number of these, the majority of these are related to labor costs. These were costs that um, were calculated centrally and assuming that the bureaus um, needed those costs to, to help them get through the year, those costs have been included. They were recommended by the budget office and they were included in what the mayor has filed. The two items that are drawing on uh, policy set aside that I would highlight for you is one, um, uh, a draw upon um, resources that were set aside in a policy set aside account um, for the sobering center. Um, the new um, program related to that is referred to as Beacon, B-H-E-C-N. Um, a funding was allocated in the fall bump to begin uh, this new transition to its new, new type of, of center. And um, there's a, a request included in the mayor's proposed to draw an additional $400,000 from that pool of resource to continue the work that, that um, was begun last fall. Um, the other item that is a draw on a policy set aside um, is uh, a draw, um, the, the line item below that is uh, $250,000, which is uh, drawing upon our, our newly established um, citywide legal priorities reserve to fund the cost of a settlement that council recently um, approved, the legal settlement that council recently approved. Yes, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you. I don't know if you wanted me to hold questions to the end, but I had a question about Beacon. Beacon. Um, I thought we were told that that was a one-time investment um, into uh, the startup of the sobering center. Has that changed? Are we going to have a more long-term relationship with Beacon than we first anticipated? Uh, I don't know if Mayor Wheeler or Sam Adams or Bobby or someone can answer that. Yeah, Commissioner, we have Mike Myers also yeah, on Mike the line. Can... Okay, there we go. Mayor, if you're comfortable, I can answer that question. Thank you. Mayor and Council, Mark. Mayor and Council, Mike Myers, uh, for the for the record, uh, Community Safety Transition Director. Commissioner, you're you're absolutely correct. Uh, when I came to you uh, maybe a year ago regarding this issue, we thought we'd have one. Uh, investment made to move this project forward. Uh, and thereafter, the project would work with other partners around the region and the county in order to supplement costs to get it through the finish line. Um, those requests, although many people uh, uh, voiced interest in helping uh, fund this, they weren't, they did not actually come to the table. Uh, we are committed at this point to get this across the finish line. We need a sobering center and a detox center for Portland. But however, I've been very open with uh, commissioners uh, and the mayor's office that we should not be in the business of long-term funding this program. Um, there is some good news. Uh, the fact that we are this far along the process, and I think this extra dollars gets us to where we need to be. Uh, we've heard um, uh, for the first time in, in, in several months, some interest amongst uh, hospitals um, um, and also some interest from private providers, uh, nonprofit providers that might wanna do this work as well. So I believe the light is at the end of the tunnel. Uh, you are correct in your in what you heard. I am coming back and asking for an additional four hundred thousand dollars. This is not the total amount that they wanted. Uh, I need to buy another few months uh, to get us farther down the road. I feel like abandoning it at this point right now would not do ourselves any good, Portland Street Response any good uh, in doing that. So this is a uh, this is an ask to get the commitment moving a little bit farther down the road while we continue to, to uh, increase our discussions with the with the relative partners. 
Uh, thank you very much for that, Director Meyer. Uh, I, you know, it's always good when I can check my memory and remember that I actually, uh, what I thought I remembered is actually what in fact happened. So I am grateful for that. Um, I, 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 this may be a conversation for a later date, but I, I want to know, like, what is the transition plan? Because just like earlier, the mayor mentioned uh, 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 funding uh, mental health beds. Um, again, we're going to be so undistinguishable from the county and the state really soon if we're not really clear what the city is obligated to fund and responsible for and what the county and the state funds. Um, so, uh, so I, 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 yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we were not on track to becoming a mental health provider or a sobering center provider. Thank yeah, you. If, if I could, if I could chime in here, uh, first of all, Commissioner Hardesty, I agree with you emphatically on that point. Uh, and in considering this request and others, that was always foremost in our conversations about whether or not we're getting into mission creep here at the city of Portland, given that, that the most substantial issues facing the community, the issues that concern our constituents the most tend to be social issues that revolve around public health, mental health, substance abuse, housing, homelessness. Uh, where, where is the line between city government and, say, county government? And that is an important conversation, and I believe we will have the opportunity to continue to engage in that conversation with our partners going forward. But the bottom line for me and the reason I supported this and put it in the proposed was that we desperately need a sobering center. We would be the only large city in the United States that does not have some sort of a sobering center. I want to acknowledge that our partners in all of this central city concern, they were legitimately seeing a very different kind of profile coming through their door. Their, um, you know, in, in the old days, it was people who were intoxicated. Now it's people who may be intoxicated and high. And uh, they had legitimate reasons to be concerned for the health and safety of their employees. And thus, we, we need to do something that's slightly different than the old Hooper detox. It needs to happen. To be blunt, we should not necessarily be the government leading this charge. But in the absence of that leadership, we have to move forward. We need that sobering facility. And so uh, I therefore felt that balancing all of these various concerns made the most sense to put this in the budget and then keep fighting for uh, that conversation around where to draw the line between the city and the county. And it's, it's always helpful to say, just since I'd be like the 10th mayor in a row to say it, um, that there should always be a consideration about whether it makes sense you know, Portland is, is at a certain size now. The metro region is a certain size. Uh, other regions have consolidated their city and their county government functions. Some cities even consolidate city, county, and school district functions. We're still very much a fragmented government community, and there are times like this when it doesn't necessarily help our constituents. So I would really recommend that we all do go forward and support this. We need Beacon to continue to move in the right direction, but you are correct, Commissioner Hardesty, that we also need to make sure that we aren't simply taking on additional social service responsibilities that would be better handled by other governments that have that expertise, the personnel, and the profile to be able to manage these kinds of programs. Thank you so much for that, Mayor. You're absolutely right. And let me just say that the uh, I was on the last city county consolidation commission. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> and I also want to say that the city charter commission and the county charter commission are both meeting right now as we speak. And I don't think they've actually met with each other yet. So an interesting conversation could be had. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Um, thank you. I think this question is for Director Kennard. Uh, sticking with the sobering center uh, issue. Uh, it was before my time. I, I, I can't remember. Can you remind us how we paid for or if the city had any role in funding Hooper Detox? 
center was that purely county or did we have some city we did yes we, we did have an allocation for for hooper detox and i believe that it was the source of funding for what this is now okay thank you very much all right um could we go to the next slide please All right, so as part of the spring supplemental budget, as I mentioned earlier, general fund bureaus may request program carryover for, for projects which were budgeted in the current year, but which will not be encumbered or spent by the end of the fiscal year. These amounts are reduced from bureau budgets and set aside for rebudgeting as part of the proposed and approved budgets for the following year. These are called program carryovers. Bureaus are requesting program carryovers in this spring bump totaling $16 million, which is significantly higher than usual. Program carryovers traditionally include projects funded with one-time resources in the current year that need additional time to complete. These are the types of carryovers that we've sort of labeled um, as, as classic carryovers. And so what we've done for you and what we're going to walk, walk you through is because of the sheer number of carryovers, we've categorized them and put them into sort of different buckets. So we can quickly walk through and, and, and sort of um, explain um, the nuances and the different, different items. So you see the bulk of the requests this year are what we would consider classic carryovers. This is largely because of the large amount of one-time resource that was allocated either in the adopted budget or the fall bump, and bureaus just need a little more time in order to complete those projects. Um, there are also requests for carryover for current year bureau underspending in order to help fund requests that were submitted for new resources um, in fiscal year 22-23 in the next um, uh, annual budget. And, and so, um, and this was allowable per mayor's guidance. And so you'll see that there are a total of about one, uh, almost $2 million of those types of requests. And those um, are, are items that you um, can see that the um, majority of which are, are recommended and we'll walk through those, I'm sorry, are recommended and also are included in the mayor's proposed. Um, and we'll walk through those individually. Um, there are also a handful of requests that are carrying over resources um, that, ha um, that are um, for items that are coming to the council um, sort of for the first time that we would sort of describe as new requests or new things that the Bureau would like to fund um, in next year's budget. And they've identified um, underspending that they could utilize to, to, to fund those new things. And those are requests for new fiscal year 23 um, items. And so we will walk through each of those as well. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna start with those groups of carryovers that are, are sort of identifying general underspending or resources that are available to support decision packages that have already been put forward as part of the fiscal year 22-23 budget. So all of these items fall into that category. Um, you can see that uh, $3 million has been requested and 2.3 million total has been included in the mayor's proposed uh, uh, supplemental budget as filed. So again, what this means is that this is functioning as a source to fund things that have been requested as part of the um, uh, requested budget in bureaus. We'll go through these line by line. So the first item is a request from the Impact Reduction Program it's to carry over $197,000 in general fund one-time resources. Um, these, this, this was resource that was allocated in the fall supplemental budget for two limited term uh, coordinator two positions. And, and so this is somewhat of a classic carryover, but it does also fund a package that the, the Bureau has requested or the Impact Reduction Program has requested the continuation of this, um, of, of this service and this package as part of their requested budget. So this would essentially fund what they have requested in um, next year's budget. So that's why it's in this category. And that is included in what the mayor has filed. Um, the second item, is um, it's a positive number because it's a, it's a fund transfer. It's not actually uh, an item that is coming back to the general fund to be rebudgeted. It's money that is in that was allocated in the impact reduction program in the fall, and they're transferring it to um, a, a, the facilities fund um, to hold that money there. So the fun functionally, this says somewhat of the same thing. It just from a county standpoint is a little bit different, um, but it's $300,000. Uh, for funding for the Low Barriers to Employment Program. This is also known as the Trash for Peace Program. Um, so Trash for Peace Program is a small organization that's building its capacity to expend these funds. And so what this will do is hold this $300,000 in the facilities fund so that the Bureau can spend it next year to complete that project. Um, the next item is from the Bureau of Human Resources. It's a request to carry over $352,739 
um, to, uh, to uh, fund two limited term uh, human resource analysts, two positions to support recruitment selection, outreach and consultation in the Bureau of Human Resources. This was also funding that was approved in the fall, but it does also correspond with a request that the Bureau has put forward for next year. So this would fund, again, a fiscal year 22-23 request. Uh, the next item is um, a request for $85,000 to carry over um, resources for um, procurement work. Um, the original, this is uh, uh, item where there was originally one-time funding of $250,000 that was allocated in the fall bump to support the creation of three limited term procurement specialists for half a year. Uh, the division is requesting approval to carry over this 85,000 for a one year limited term procurement specialist in order to retain high performing uh, temporary or summer intern at the end of their placement this coming summer. And again, there's a nexus with a request for resources in next year's budget there. The next item is a request to carry over $250,000 in general fund underspending and resources to pay for what's called phase 2B of the long range uh, facilities master plan. This is gonna be focused on space and location needs, real estate feasibility for multi-bureau shared facilities with an emphasis on maintenance, operations, community safety, and emergency response facilities. This was a request that was also included in next year's requested budget. Um, the following item is $200,000 to care, uh, uh, for a comprehensive community safety strategic plan. Strategic plan will build upon bureau specific plans that are in operation and will provide capacity for public safety bureaus that are operating without a strategic plan. The community safety division did receive $400,000 in the current adopted budget for community safety plan, um, but the bureau is requesting to carry over and reappropriate uh, some of these resources for a public safety provider call allocation, which we'll discuss um, in, in another uh, grouping shortly. Uh, the next item is uh, a request to carry over general underspending to support the uh, new unified communications uh, team that was funded uh, on a one-time basis with ARPA resources. So um, the CAO's office has identified underspending that they would like to carry over to continue funding that work. And it does align also, again, with a fiscal year 22-23 uh, budget request. Um, the next item is the um, one of the only items that is not included at this time. It is uh, a request to carry over $400,000 that was allocated in the fall bump to hire up to 25 retiree hire officers to address current staffing shortages. Um, this funding was intended to cover the additional benefit costs of each of the retiree hire positions. Um, and uh, to date, no officers have signed on to the retiree hire program. So, um, this was not something that was originally recommended by the budget office given the um, uh, given the lack of interest in the program. However, if it were successful, it could have um, meaningful impacts on retaining um, staffing, addressing staffing issues. So that may be an item that council wishes to discuss. Uh, the next item is funding to uh, uh, a carryover request to uh, support. It was originally requested by the police bureau to to uh, support basic training academy um, for new officers. Um, however, it's what's being included in the mayor's proposed supplemental budget is to develop, uh, is, is funding to develop enhanced training and monitoring efforts for non-sworn PPD staff, including the police cadet, police corps, and PS3 positions. So this funding um, is included in, in what the mayor has filed, but for a slightly different purpose than what was originally requested. Uh, the next item is for um, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to carry over $276,680 uh, to fund the completion of the floodplain resilience plan and identified follow-up work, which is focused on Johnson Creek, an area with a large floodplain where vulnerable populations live. Next item also from the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to carry over $90,000 to expand the uh, planning program's capacity to advance equitable historic preservation projects in response to public testimony submitted to the city council during the adoption of the historic resources code project. Uh, the final item from the Bureau of Planning Sustainability would carry over $300,000 to fund the um, Bureau's request uh, for climate emergency funds in next year's budget. Uh, to help decarbonize the grid and the transportation systems. This, these resources would fund one position across two fiscal years. So all three of those items from the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability are related to requests that they have submitted as part of their fiscal year 22-23 requested budget. Are there any questions on any of these? 
All right, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so this grouping of carryover requests are items that um, are, are for where bureaus have identified underspending or identified resources in their budget that they would like to reappropriate and carry over for something that um, was not um, requested uh, as a uh, as part of their, their budget already. So it's something that may be relatively new to the council. So we'll spend a moment highlighting each of these items. The first item is a request from the attorney's office to carry over $300,000. Uh, to address some of their um, uh, legal software needs. And I will say that this is something that the, the Bureau has brought forward in previous years. Um, it is a practice that is in alignment with financial policy um, to identify you know, a way, any way to sort, sort of support your technology and equipment needs. And so this would go towards supporting their, their technology needs and, and um, required legal software upgrades. Uh, the next item is a request from the Bureau of Emergency Manager uh, Management, and it supports a local grant match for an award that is anticipated to occur just shortly after the end of the fiscal year. So they need to carry over to make sure that they can still give this grant match for the, that anticipated award. Um, and the grant will be for earthquake preparedness and resiliency work for the city. Um, the next item is um, it shows up as a positive number um, because it's a, it, instead of asking to uh, take back the general funds and budget them in next year, it's it's transferring money um, within the city to to a separate fund, and so it would transfer resources from fire's general fund into its capital fund for new vehicle purchases that have been ordered but won't be encumbered or delivered into the in um, until the next fiscal year due to supply chain delays. So this just allows them to keep money that's in their budget right now for, for vehicles that they, they, um, they plan to order, but they don't expect to actually be able to receive until next fiscal year. Um, their vehicles for Portland Street Response, Arts and Investigations and Vehicle Pool Replacements. The next item is $400,000. Uh, it's a request from procurement to partially fund its interagency agreement with the Portland Bureau of Transportation for design and construction services next year. Um, just worth noting that um, this, this request is somewhat tied to the um, general fund compensation set aside uh, request from the Office of Management and Finance. Those are all included currently. If one was taken out, it might affect the other. So just as a flag there. Uh, the next item is a request from the Community Safety Division within the CAO's office. It carries over $600,000 of um, funding that was allocated in the fall um, uh, was allocated, I'm sorry, in the adopted budget of this year for um, the community safety strategic plan and a consultant review of the police staffing model. And, and so the proposal from um, CSD is to reappropriate the funds for an expanded public safety service provider call allocation study and for a public safety staffing study. So the purpose of these studies is to provide an assessment of the call types that are dispatched to public safety service providers and the modeling of these types and number of public safety providers that are needed in order to respond to various call types. A separate carryover request was submitted by um, for the community safety strategic planning, which I had discussed on the last slide. Um, the next item is a request to carry over $50,000 in general fund resources to cover a projected revenue shortfall in the hearings office. Um, in their, their next year's budget. Um, I think that this also aligns with the Bureau has submitted an ARPA request to this um, for this as well. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been fewer requests for appeal for tow appeal hearings um, to challenge the vehicle tows due to changes in the city's parking enforcement efforts. Funding to address the hearings office projected revenue shortfalls is not included in what's being filed currently. Um, as the city reconsiders its fine and fee equity in the context of parking enforcement policies. Uh, so the next item is from the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services. Um, it requests funding to carry over resources for the Clean Air Construction Program and the Procurement Services Division. This is something that you have seen before. It is something that is a contractual obligation that's laid out in the city's ID with other jurisdictions. So every year that there's underspending in this particular IGA, there's a request to carry over resources um, to continue funding the work of the Clean Air Construction Program. The next item is a, a, um, a, a request for $100,000 that would carry over vacancy savings within the mayor's office to help fill an administrative support gap due to um, services that will no longer be provided by the Office of Management and Finance. Um, the next two items are connected. 
and they are um, related to a request from the Office for um, Community and Civic Life. So the Bureau is requesting to carry over almost $650,000 uh, from personal vacancy savings to help accomplish their strategic planning work through fiscal year 2324. The request includes paying for two, uh, two consulting firms to undertake strategic planning, both for the, their, their internal stakeholders and their external city stakeholders. Also to contract with Portland State University Research Centers to organize an urban co-governance summit and create common uh, vocabulary and to pay for communications related staff support. What's included in what the mayor has filed is $400,000 and that's in order to also allow for carryover to support um, the neighborhood small grants program, which was a request that the Bureau put forward as part of their fiscal year 22-23 uh, budget. Um, it, this would reduce the ability of Civic Life to complete, completely fund their, uh, their strategic planning efforts. It would either um, uh, allow for um, a, a shortened timeline of contracted services or it would um, allow for a reduced scope of services for contracted services. So that is worth noting. And that may be something that the council would like to talk about. Um, the, net, the final item on this list is a request to carry over $170,000 for the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. And um, the funding is primarily driven by current year vacancy savings. The program is proposing to use these resources for professional facilitation, interpretation, meeting live streaming, office relocation costs, and contracts with community-based organizations for outreach week work as requested by the community members. That concludes this list. Are there any questions on any of the items in this list? Next slide, please. So I am not going to spend time going through each of these. Um, it's a long list. These are items that we have designated as uh, what are sort of classic carryovers. Again, there's a significant number of carryovers this year just because of the large amount of one-time general fund that was uh, allocated in the adopted budget and then the fall bump, which was only four short months ago. So um, a number of bureaus are just requesting to carry over resources that were allocated on a one-time basis to them within the last you know, 10 months um, to continue the work that was originally approved by, by the council. Um, I will say that a couple of the items have more general titles, which I can um, I, I will illuminate what those are. And, and Commissioner Hardesty, do you have a question first? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I'm just curious if you've had a chance, Director Kanad, to look at all the carryovers and compare them to the new requests that we will be voting on in a couple of weeks after we vote on this. Um, and is there a way that we can uh, be able to see something that actually shows us whether we're increasing service delivery or whether we're just really continuing to do things that came up because they were as part of either the fall bump mm -hmm. or last year's budget recommendations. I, I know for me, it's kind of hard to remember all these special allocations and where they went, whether or not those dollars were used as intended. So I just want to know how we're going to uh, compare this to what we're being asked for now. Yes, excellent question. So the first answer to your question, Commissioner, is that the um, slide, and Robert, can you go back two slides? Is um, the group of this group of carryovers that we walk through first, these are the carryovers that will be funding things that you are, have already heard about, that you've already talked about, that were requested as part of next year's budget. So that's, that's the first thing. And then um, Robert, please go back to the classic carryover slide. I will say that there are some still some interactions here um, with, with the work that folks have asked to, um, to do as part of next year's budget. And, and so um, um, what we can do is we can, we can make sure to flag as part of our, our materials in, um, in the request, in the, the mayor's request, I'm sorry, the mayor's proposed budget as well as the approved budget what the funding source is for all of the different items that are included so it can so you can have a sense of um, what's being funded with new money versus what is being continued through um, the use of underspending or or um, money that was allocated as part of the, this current year's budget process. 
Thank you so much. I also remember as part of the fall bump, we fund some two and three year projects. And uh, so the same thing applies is that I, I, I just want to make sure that we're not funding the same thing two or three times and that we, the money that we, you know, the limited dollars that we have, we're actually spreading yes. it out in a way that makes sense. So I, I would appreciate any help you can do on that because I know if it's difficult for me, I imagine it's a little challenging for our budget committee to keep up on all these uh, swirling numbers. Thank you. Absolutely, Commissioner. And, and um, I can promise you that our office tries to look very closely at these things because at some point during the budget process, we get to the phase where we say we're looking under couch cushions and we just want to, we also want to be sure that we are not double funding anything and we're making the most use of all of our available resource. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Okay, and so um, I just would highlight here, so all of these have been recommended as requested with the exception of one item that was withdrawn by the Bureau. Um, I will highlight a couple of these have um, uh, broad titles. So, um, and actually uh, the, um, the, I apologize for the acronyms here. We're using our, um, our two digit <laughs> accounting code, which in some cases is um, intuitive, but not in all cases. So BO is budget office, CB is um, office for community technology, EM is um, emergency management, GR is government relations, HC is the Housing Bureau, MF is the Office of Management and Finance, NI is actually the Office of Community and Civic Life, because it uh, changed its name recently, OE is the Office of Equity and Human Rights, PK is Parks and Recreation, PL is the Police Bureau, PN is the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, SA is Special Appropriations, and ZD, which is the trickiest one, is Prosper Portland. Um, uh, GR, the program carryover government relations, that is, um, that is a, a, a program carryover for their strategic planning efforts. That is um, a classic carryover that was resources that was allocated to them on a one-time basis for, um, for this very purpose. Um, due to staff turnover, they've not been able to complete their strategic plan, so they're just asking for the continued carryover to complete that in next year's budget process. Um, Office of Equity and Human Rights. Um, is a, 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 com a combination of, of several items um, that were allocated predominantly in the spring bump, um, I'm sorry, the fall bump of last year. The biggest piece of this is um, funding to uh, continue work for the, um, uh, let's see, the um, LGBTQIA program and reparation study. That, that's, there's $230,000 for that. I will say part of this actually does tie to next year's budget process, Commissioner. This is there is funding in here to fund the um, anti-white supremacy training, um, which was nine nine ninety five hundred dollars. It was a request in next year's budget. Um, it also includes ninety thousand dollars for the diverse and empowered employees program leadership development uh, program cohort, the deep program cohort. Let's see. Excuse me, uh, Director Kanad. I think the uh... It was to plan for the city's um, uh, white nationalist training, not to conduct it. Uh, we've had that conversation. Yes. Thank you for that clarifying point. Yes. All right. Are there any other questions on any of these items? And again, our office will be available um, for, for questions uh, over the next several days. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, these are um, a short list of some of the non-general fund changes that were included as part of the, um, the, the what was filed in the mayor's proposed bump. Um, so um, there, there, there were a number of non-general fund changes. Most of them were highly technical. Just wanted to highlight a couple of the items that we thought might be more notable that council might want to be aware of. Um, the proposed supplemental budget does draw $2.9 million from American Rescue Plan Act contingency resources. This is first tranche contingency resources that we have available in order to fund two new projects. Um, they have been set aside specifically, uh, that they, I'm sorry, this contingency resource had been set aside for housing stabilization, um, but are not expected to be needed in the current year. 
One allocation is for the Fairfield Retail Revitalization Project, which the mayor mentioned in his opening remarks, which is 1.9 million. We'll restore 3,000 um, square feet of retail space in the West End and Pride Plaza along Southwest Harvey Milk. And the other allocation is a million dollars for operational funding for Bybee Lakes Hope Center. This will allow for expansion of adding 200 beds to the facility. Yes, Commissioner Maps. Um, these are old ARPA dollars or are these round two or round three ARPA dollars? These are old. These are resources that were um, allocated in the first tranche last summer as a contingency for some of the housing and ho the houselessness initiatives. Um, and, and, and they have been deemed by the ARPA implementation team and the project managers to not be needed for the first tranche activities. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the second item that we I would highlight is just that the, the Housing Bureau is carrying is making a number of adjustments to multi-year affordable housing projects, which is typical in the supplemental budget processes to better align their project budgets with construction timelines. Um, in total, they're carrying over $45 million in grant resources, tax increment finance dollars, bond funds, and other resources for affordable housing project costs into the next year. Um, the Bureau of Environmental Services is recognizing an additional $24 million of rate revenues and 15 um, million in system development charge revenues due to conservative budgeting in response to the economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, the, um, let's see, the Water Bureau is also adjusting its beginning fund balance by 124 million to match the Comprehensive Annual Financing, financing Report or CAFR for the Hydroelectric Power Operating Fund, the Water Fund and the Water Construction Fund. Um, those are sort of the larger items that we saw that we felt like um, warranted highlighting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's one that, yeah, and there's, there's one more list of items. So um, we also would highlight that the, um, sorry, my, something's blocking my screen. There we go. Um, so risk management division within the Bureau of Revenue Financial Services um, is, is drawing from contingency in both their insurance and claims fund and the work for compensation fund. Contingency exists for a reason. Um, we that, that it is acceptable to draw on contingency. This does play into some of the conversations that you had heard about last month during budget development with some of our, our risk um, uh, and insurance pool costs going up. The Bureau of Technology Services is abating charges as part of the printing and distributions three-year plan to improve and stabilize uh, the PND's fund status. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's worth noting that some bureaus continue to be hit hard by the pandemic, um, uh, or certain funds continue to be hit hard by the pandemic. Um, the um, Bureau of Transportation, um, I think, continues to um, struggle with some of the, the parking fee revenues. And um, the uh, printing and distribution is um, has not rebounded in terms of folks' use of, of printing. <laughs> um, the Bureau of Techno uh, Tele Technology Services is also drawing by about $500,000 from their reserves to pay for various unanticipated items and projects. Um, this just re this represents about you know, six and a half percent of their amount established in their reserves, but we felt like it was prudent to highlight. And then um, finally, the Office of Community and Civic Life is requesting a carryover of $3.9 million of recreational cannabis tax funds associated with Reimagine Oregon's uh, community-led budgeting efforts. Folks will recall this was an allocation that was originally allocated in the fall bump of a year and a half ago, fall bump of um, fiscal year uh, 2021. And um, an ongoing allocation of cannabis resources allocated at that point for a community-led budgeting process. Um, Reimagine Oregon experience turnover. We experienced some turnover in the city. Um, that initiative hasn't gotten off the ground yet. So the funding has been carried over and it's being carried over again, um, leading up to, to um, that work that will be led by Reimagine Oregon. Yes, Commissioner Maps, I saw your hand first. Uh, your comments, uh, uh, your final comments there address some of my questions here, which is basically what is the plan for programming that $3.9 million in Reimagine Oregon? set asides. Is that going to happen this fiscal year? Yes, it will. I, I, I just got an update from the Office of Civic and Community Life on what the Re, uh, Rethink Portland uh, initiative is. They've just hired a staff person. Uh, they will be being onboarded this month. And uh, so we will see programmatic work coming out of that initiative uh, in the next fiscal year. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. You're welcome. No worry.
All right, next slide, please. Um, so we always make sure that we highlight any changes in um, permanent position authority. This spring bump, there's only one request for a change in position. Um, it's from the Portland Children's Levy to create a full new time, uh, I'm sorry, a new full-time permanent position that utilizes their existing positions. It mirrors and it, it does, it is in alignment with the Bureau's fiscal year 22-23 requested budget. And the budget office is recommending it and it has been included in what the mayor has filed. Uh, next slide, please. So we do conduct budget monitoring at this time of year. We primarily are looking to make sure that bureaus are staying on track uh, in their current year budgets, that they're not projecting to overspend their budget. Um, but we do also ask for um, feedback on decision packages and we look at other financial um, indicators as well. These are just a few things that we would choose to highlight for you all. Um, citywide position vacancies, um, supply chain issues, Deploying new and large programming and typical, cap typical capital project delays are driving underspending for most bureaus, which we have already discussed. Um, this is evidenced, as I've discussed earlier, by the, the, the amount of carryover that is being requested is, is a larger amount than usual. Um, as I, I spoke to a little bit on the last couple of slides, it is worth noting that the Bureau of Environmental Services and Development Services are showing signs of recovery from the economic impacts of the pandemic, which is good news. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, the Portland Bureau of Transportation and Printing and Distribution Fund have also felt the impacts of remote work. Um, combined bureaus provided updates on 325 decision packages for $438 million in resources that were allocated in this last year. So really a phenomenal amount of resource. We have updates. Um, we haven't summarized them for you here, but we will make them available in the dashboard format on our website for members of the council and the public to view. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, I um, want to let you all know where we stand with regards to our general fund contingency balances following the packages that we just walked through and what is included in the mayor's proposed supplemental budget. So with everything that we've walked through, contingency totals, uh, general fund contingency totals $39.3 million. This includes $16 million of the general fund carryover. So what technically we have to do is we take money out of the current year budget, we hold it in contingency so that we can appropriate it in next year's budget. So not all of that 39 million is available for appropriation. 16 million is earmarked for the, the carryovers that have been approved. 4.5 million does remain in personnel contingency accounts, which CBO, we do recommend that we retain um, some, if not all of that balance for potential current year personnel costs. There is also $5 million that remains in unrestricted contingency, which can be used either for current year needs as part of this process or the over expenditure process at the end of the year. Um, it can also, that $5 million can also be used should council choose to support items in next year's budget. So you can take the money out of the current year and use it to support one-time general fund needs in next year's 22-23 um, adopted budget. As part of that balance, there is still a million dollars that's sitting in capital set aside, but I will note we have been including that in our um, assumed forecast resources and, and we are planning on council budgeting that um, for capital set aside eligible projects in the 22-23 process. And then there remains $12.6 million in policy set aside accounts. Are there any questions about any of that? Okay, uh, next slide. I think we have reached, um, the conclusion of me talking a lot through a lot of line items. Um, I will open it up to see if there are any general or specific questions. Um, I will share that that what happens next is um, we will be um, supporting you in your conversations. Uh, we are available to talk through any of these packages and we will support you in the development of any requested uh, changes to, um, to the mayor's proposed um, in advance of next, uh, next Wednesday's hearing. Yes, Commissioner Max. Um, I'd like to revisit the Providence Park groundwater intrusion um, proposal, if I could. Um, first, uh, and we can pull up the slide or we don't necessarily have to pull up the slide. Um, um, but for the moment, yeah, pulling up the slide would be, would be uh, helpful for now. Um, first, as the director or the commissioner in charge of uh, the Bureau of Environmental uh, Services, there are 
uh, limits to how I can spend uh, ratepayer dollars. Uh, do we, have we gotten clarity from the lawyers as to whether or not this is a um, legally appropriate expenditure? Commissioner, thank you for the question. I have not had the opportunity to connect with them yet, but that is something that we absolutely want to confirm. So I will be working with um, the Bureau of Environmental Services and the attorneys to, to confirm that as well. Okay, uh, great. And uh, a follow-up question on this. Uh, how, how is this a sewer project? So, um, I may have to defer to um, one of our analysts on the line who really got into the details sure. of some of these packages. It was related to a sewer relining, but when when um, uh, folks took a look at how we got to this place and how we got to this issue, there was um, some sense that it was related to a, a sewer relining. Uh, part of the challenge was related to a sewer relining project in the right of way. Um, Shannon uh, Fairchild, if you're on the line, is there anything that you could add or elaborate to the question? Uh, no, you, you you captured it. It was largely given the, the timing of when the groundwater issues started um, and the research that was conducted to try to figure out why that was happening. The conclusion was it was, um, while it's difficult to definitively prove um, that it was um, likely the result of relining a project. So water that previously was uh, kind of being absorbed into an, an old pipe and that project was relined so that no longer could go into the pipe. Um, it also, um, in combination with um, uh, development from a BDS project. Uh, okay, are we still investigating the cause, uh, or the causes uh, of this water situation or is that assessment the, the, the final assessment? My understanding is that that is kind of the, the, the research into the problem was the, the final conclusion. Okay, thank and you. And now they're much. taking steps to mitigate it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I do look forward to hearing what the lawyers say about whether or not this is an allowable expenditure. <clears throat> Since we have a few moments, uh, Director, I'm curious, uh, the summer recovery efforts that are under the Office of Management and Finance, I'm a bit confused. Are they just managing contracts or? Uh, that that item, the um, um, one point, it was at the one point four million dollar summer recovery efforts. That's within the community safety division because those um, those events are are related to um, community safety and violence prevention. Um, Robert, you were on the right slide before. It was the new it was new requests. There we go. Yeah, it's the fourth one down. Summer recovery efforts, one point four million. Is that the one that you're referring to, Commissioner? Yes. That is correct. And that is the Office of, of uh, uh, Community Safety, you said? And, and Okay, I got it. Thank you. Yes. Any other items for um, follow-up or conversation? Yes, Commissioner Max. Um, it might help me, or it would help me if we could revisit the policy set-asides. I think, do we have a 12-point? Six million policy set aside slide. Yeah, uh, can, can you unpack for us a little bit what's yes. in that 12.6 million? Absolutely. Um, so there are, it looks like about 10 or 12 different items, but I will walk through them briefly. Um, the first is there's $1.1 million for our paid family medical leave. This is funding we've set aside to make sure that we're ready to go when the state implements the paid family medical leave policy. It was supposed to be implemented this last January. They've delayed it for a year, so we still have funding set aside for that. Um, there is still a, a, a $1.1 million balance for the Portland Street response. This is funding that, that has been allocated as part of the requested budget for next year. But okay. for the current year, there remains a balance still of one-time resource. Um, there's $1 million for a houseless participatory budgeting process. There's $1 million for habitat restoration. $762,036 remain for the sobering services. This is after that $400,000 draw. Um, there's $50,000 that's set aside for accessibility services. 
Um, there's $3.6 million that we retain for truing up our general fund overhead model. Every year we have funding that we set aside to make sure that we have um, the appropriate amount to true up that model. Um, there is a combined uh, $370,981, both for um, legal priorities reserve as well as um, legal services as it relates to bargaining needs. Um, there is uh, remains a balance. If you'll recall, funding was set aside for our PS3 program, Public Safety Support Specialists. So there remains $448,257 for the, that program. Um, there is $670,000 that was set aside in the fall bump for O'Brien Square. And there um, is $850,000 um, as part of a, a transfer um, by the impact reduction program that is uh, similar to um, sort of a program carryover. It's money that's set aside for programming in 22-23. Uh, great, uh, um, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I, I didn't uh, uh, um, write it down, but I think we have about a million dollars in there for uh, to, facil to facilitate uh, houseless folks participating in our budget processes. Uh, what's the plan for programming those funds? So I can I can let um, Commissioner Hardesty speak to some of the details, but the the um, uh, Fire Bureau has proposed on an ongoing basis that that one million dollars be repurposed to support the ongoing needs, um, the ongoing costs of supporting Portland Street response and rolling that that program out. That is one of the funding sources that has been proposed to fund the ongoing programming needs for Portland Street response. Um, the, that funding, it, should council approve that, that would be effective starting next fiscal year. And this $1 million is still available on a one-time basis in the current year. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. So um, again, we have our hearing. Next Wednesday, um, we would request that um, uh, council offices get in contact with us no later than Tuesday to uh, discuss any um, interest in amendments. We will work individually with you. Um, we don't have to share your amendments with anybody else, but we can facilitate that if you'd like um, to make sure that any amendments that you propose are in the appropriate format to make sure they achieve what you'd like to achieve, particularly since carryovers in particular are a little complex with the interaction between this budget and the next budget. Um, so the deadline again is um, next Tuesday um, to work with our office on any amendments that we'd like to see. Um, Mayor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director. From our great presentation today, uh, I know you just took hundreds and hundreds of hours worth of work and consolidated that work onto uh, a number of slides. And you made a very complex process, very, very straightforward. Uh, so I thank you, thank my colleagues. Obviously, we're not making any decisions today. This is a work session. It gives us a chance to, to digest some of these pages of numbers. Uh, before we leave, I also wanted to pass on a couple of thoughts from Commissioner Ryan. He obviously wanted to be here, uh, but he had some other obligations that required him to be elsewhere today. So I just want to read some of his thoughts. Uh, he asked me to pass along two items for the record that he will consider bringing amendments for. The first is a potential amendment for $3.5 million for the Portland Housing Bureau to do land banking to secure development of affordable housing. His second is a potential amendment for $175,000 to go to special appropriations for permit improvement implementation, specifically prioritizing the hiring of a planning and implementation team. And of course, he'll, he'll give you more details about this when he's able to join us next week. Uh, but he'd asked me if I'd please give you a heads up on that just so you could consider it. I'm sure we'll reach out to you uh, to discuss his proposals as well. Uh, is there anything else for the good of the order here before we adjourn? Seeing nothing, uh, again, thanks to everybody. Great presentation, good discussion, and we are adjourned. Recording stopped.